Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens The Main Characters Oliver Twist Oliver was born in a workhouse, and though he is treated with cruelty for most of his life, he remains innocent throughout. Fajin He is a cunning criminal who takes in homeless children and trains them to become pickpockets. Nancy She is one of Fajin's former child pickpockets. Mr. Brownlow He is Oliver's first benefactor and is kind to Oliver. Bill Sykes he is part of Fajin's gang and murders Nancy in the end. Mr. Bumble He is a church official who presides over the workhouse that Oliver was born in. Agnes Fleming Oliver Twist's mother The Artful Dodger One of Fajin's cleverest pickpockets Charlie Bates Another of Fajin's pickpockets Mrs. Maley A kind wealthy elderly woman the mother of Harry Maley and adoptive aunt of Rose. Rose Maley, Agnes Fleming's elder sister who was raised by Mrs. Maley. Harry Maley, Mrs. Maley's son. A child was born in the workhouse of a parish in England. Nobody remembers when, but it was a day that a baby boy was born an orphan. His mother died giving birth to him. A real pity, for she was such a young and beautiful woman. Who was she? asked the doctor. No idea, said the nurse. We found her lying on the road last night, so we took her in. She must have walked a long way, for her shoes were worn out. She must be unmarried. I can't see a wedding ring, said the doctor. He then left the baby in the care of the workhouse that looked after orphans. They gave him the name Oliver Twist. When he was hardly a year old, Oliver was sent to another workhouse where he, with 25 other children, lived for 8 years. Some were born troublemakers. Others like Oliver just didn't have anyone to care for them. Mrs. Mann, who ran the workhouse, received money from the parish to buy food and clothes for the children. She however kept most of the money for herself. The only time she looked after the children well by giving them good clothes and a good bath was when an official from the parish came for inspection. On Oliver's ninth birthday, one such official from the church came to the workhouse. Oliver had grown into a thin, pale, malnourished and miserable child. When the official, Mr. Bumble, saw him and his condition, he went angrily to Mrs. Mann. Mr. Bumble was a very fat man, middle-aged and bad-tempered. I see that Oliver has turned nine today, he said. That's right, said Mrs. Mann. Did you know that the parish offered large sum of money for anyone who could get information about his father? We have no clue as to where he came from. Why is he called Oliver Twist? asked Mrs. Mann. I gave him that name. I name all the children alphabetically. The child before him was S, so I called him Swabble. Oliver is a T, so he is Twist. I've given names from A to Z. All right, said Mrs. Mann. But why are you asking about Oliver today? The boy is too old to be staying here. I'm going to take him back to the workhouse where he was born. Oliver was given a slice of bread and a simple outfit with a brown cap to wear outside. He meekly followed him outside the workhouse to his new home. Once there, he was brought before a committee of ten men. Boy, what's your name? Snarled the chairman. Oliver Twist, sir. You know that you're an orphan, is that right? What's an orphan, sir? asked Oliver very innocently. It means you've been raised by the parish, for you have neither a mother nor a father. The information shocked Oliver so much, he burst into tears. Stop your tears, boy, cried the chairman. You must pray and thank God that the good people of the church feed you. That night, poor Oliver cried himself to sleep on a thin, narrow and hard bed. The next day, he met the other children of the workhouse and had his first meal with them. The food tasted terrible and it was far from filling. They were given soup three times a day, an onion twice a week, and half a roll on Sundays. Finally, after nearly starving for three months, the children decided to choose one from among them who would go and ask the cook for a second helping. Oliver was chosen. 
Oliver took his plate and walked over to Mr. Lemkins, who was serving dinner. Please, sir, might I have some more? He whispered. Mr. Lemkin's eyes popped open as he couldn't believe what he just heard. What did you say? He roared. I... I would like some supper, sir, Oliver stammered. Mr. Lemkin's eyes fled dangerously. He stormed to the door and yelled for Mr. Bumble, who got very angry with Oliver. Put the boy in a room all by himself, declared Mr. Bumble. That should teach him not to ask for too much to eat. The next morning, Mr. Bumble posted a sign outside the workhouse offering a sum of five pounds to anyone who could take Oliver away and teach him a trade. Mr. Bumble made Oliver miserable and the boy couldn't wait to get away from the workhouse. One day, Mr. Garfield walked past the workhouse and saw the notice about Oliver. He was a chimney sweeper. I can teach a boy to be a chimney sweeper, he told Mr. Limpkins, but that's a nasty job for a boy. The child could die with all that smoke and dust going into his lungs. You won't let me have him then? For three pounds. You won't have to spend much on taking care of the boy, for he hardly eats. If he troubles you, just spank him. Mr. Bumble went to the judge to get the papers signed, transferring Oliver to Mr. Gumfield. I'll make you an apprentice, Oliver, Mr. Gumfield told Oliver. What's an apprentice, sir? whispered Oliver. It means that I'm going to teach you the tricks of the trade and make a man of you. The judge saw the look of horror on Oliver's face and his teary eyes. What's wrong, boy? asked the judge. Oliver began sobbing bitterly. He got to his knees and begged the judge not to hand him over to a cruel man like Mr. Gumfield. Without a second thought, the judge tore up the papers and ordered Mr. Bumble to take Oliver back to the workhouse and treat him better. The next person to read the sign was Mr. Swaberry, the undertaker. I need somebody to help me bury the dead, he thought. He went to see Mr. Bumble. The boy is yours for five pounds, said Mr. Bumble. Oliver then gathered all his belongings, which were so few in number that they all fit into a paper bag. He went with Mr. Bumble to the undertaker's house crying the entire way. Stop crying, shouted Mr. Bumble. Be thankful that you are going to have a home because of the undertaker. Oliver's sobs subsided into hiccups. I'm sorry, sir, he whispered. Mrs. Sowerberry was a short, plump woman with a mean temper. She scolded at Oliver when she saw him. Look at him, she said, all skin and bones. She led him to a cold kitchen. Charlotte, she called the maid. Give the boy the meat we set aside for the dog. It was really a sad thing to watch the poor little Oliver hang on to a piece of meat which tasted almost like rubber. After he had eaten, Mrs. Swaberry led him down a flight of stairs to the basement. When the light from the candle fell on the room, Oliver couldn't hide his horror. The room was filled with empty coffins, big and small. Mrs. Swaberry left Oliver with the candle and walked out, shutting the door behind her. Oliver looked around the room filled with open caskets and found a hard mattress among them. He couldn't sleep that night, for the room was extremely hot. The next morning, someone kicked at the door. Oliver opened it and saw an ugly boy of about 19 giving him a shy look. Do you need a coffin, sir? Oliver asked. Shut up! The young man said as he pushed past Oliver and entered the room. I'm Noah Claypole and you'll be working under me. Noah was a charity boy but not a workhouse orphan. He knew who his parents were even though they ignored him enough to make him think that he was good as an orphan. Mr. Swaberry showed Oliver what undertakers did. One day, they went to a house where a woman had died. Her husband and children were crying over the body. Mr. Sowerberry and Noah picked up the body and placed it in a coffin. They took it and buried it in the churchyard. Mr. Sowerberry then asked Oliver if he wanted to become an undertaker. Oliver shook his head in dislike. Oliver was ill-treated by both Mrs. Sowerberry and Charlotte and even worse by Noah. One day, Noah said bad things about Oliver's dead mother. 
The boy who looked too weak to even kill a fly held Noah by the throat and threw him to the ground. He began pulling his collar fiercely. Help! shouted Noah. Oliver is going to kill me. Get him off me. Mrs. Swaberry, Charlotte. They came running inside and dragged Oliver into a dark cellar and locked him in. Mrs. Swaberry told Noah to inform Mr. Bumble about Oliver. But he was calling my mother names, said Oliver. She deserved it, said Noah. Liar. Mr. Swaberry beat Oliver severely that night and gave him nothing but a stale piece of bread to eat. Oliver began to cry when he was alone. Once he was done, he wrapped up his belongings, climbed through the window and left the house forever. Oliver walked 70 miles to London. In such a big city, no one would ever find him. It was chilly and his feet hurt, but he was happy to leave his old miserable life behind. He begged at cottages for food and water and slept in haystacks. After walking for a week, Oliver came across a boy of his own age who dressed and acted like a man. He was short, bow-legged and had ugly eyes. His clothes were soiled and his heart was too big for his small head. His pants were baggy and reached below his knees. Hey young fella, he called Oliver in a thick cockney accent. What are you up to? I've been on the road for a week. I'm tired and hungry, said the boy feebly. Come on then, I'll get you some food. Saying this, the boy, Jack Dawkins, or the artful dodger, got Oliver some bread and meat and then took him to a tavern for some beer. It was the biggest meal Oliver remembered having. Going to London then? Yes. No way I'll stay? No. That money? No, replied Oliver. I'm going to London myself, said the Dodger. I know someone who will give you a free room and board if I introduce you. Oliver went with him willingly to a broken down house in a filthy, foul smelling street in London. Oi, Fajin, the Dodger called out. You're there? I got someone I want you to meet. They saw an ugly old man dressed in flannel and cooking sausages. His mouth cracked into a grin. At a table were five boys, drinking spirits and smoking long clay pipes. There was a clothes rack on which many silk handkerchiefs were hung. Here's my friend, Oliver Twist, announced the Dodger. Fajin looked at Oliver, surprised, and then took out a box from the trap door in the floor. Inside were beautiful gold watches rings and other jewelry. Oliver didn't understand why a man with so many riches would live in such a horrible place. He thought that Fajin must be spending all his money looking after the boys. He washed himself in the basin and threw out the dirty water as Fajin suggested. He then ate breakfast with Fajin, the Dodger and Charlie Bates. What did you boys bring back today? asked Fajin. We got four silky handkerchiefs, replied Charlie. Very good. Oliver, would you like to be able to make such beautiful things? Yes, sir, if you will teach me. The other boy started laughing. Oh, we will teach you. Oliver didn't get the joke in the conversation. He was even more confused at the game they all played after breakfast. Fajin dressed like an English gentleman and stuffed his pockets with a handkerchief, wallet, snuff box and other objects. He picked up a cane and began starting around the room. The boys followed him silently around the room. When the gentleman stopped, one of the boys stepped on his foot, while another cleverly emptied his pocket of his objects. Then before the victim could turn around, they all disappeared. Later, Fajin told Oliver that Charlie and the Dodger would be great men. Take the advice, do what they do, and you will be famous too. Now try and take this handkerchief out of my back pocket without me feeling it. Oliver did exactly what Charlie and the Dodger did, smoothly removing the objects from the pocket. Fajin was proud of him and gave him a shilling. After Oliver had practiced the trick for many days, he was allowed to go out with Charlie and the Dodger. The Dodger led Oliver to a bookstall in a busy street. 
See that old man there looking at the books? Watch us. He and Charlie ran towards the gentleman who did not realize that he was going to be sneaked upon. He never saw them remove his handkerchief from his pocket. While Oliver watched in horror, they ran away. He finally understood what Fajin and the boys did. He began running as fast as he could, but the other boys were already out of sight. The gentleman turned around and saw Oliver dash past him. Stop, thief! He shouted, thinking Oliver had robbed him. The poor boy found himself being chased by people and even dogs. Someone in the crowd, a young man with purple lips and red sauce all over his hands, grabbed Oliver and knocked him down. Oliver tasted blood as he cut his lip. He was dragged up by a policeman and was taken before the judge, even though the old gentleman didn't find the handkerchief on him. He saw how pale the boy looked and said to the judge, your honor, I think the boy is unwell. Don't be too harsh with him. The moment the gentleman uttered these words, Oliver fainted and fell on the floor. The owner of the bookstore pushed his way through the crowd and swore that Oliver wasn't the boy who robbed the gentleman. All charges dropped, said the judge. The gentleman, Mr. Brownlow, then called for his courage. I will take him with me. The boy is burning up with fever. Mr. Brownlow's house was big and beautiful, nothing like Fudgeon's. Oliver slept on a comfortably large bed with clean sheets and soft pillows. The housekeeper, Mrs. Bedwin, nursed Oliver back to health in few days. It was then that Mr. Brownlow saw the striking resemblance between Oliver and a beautiful woman whose portraits hung in the living room. Look, Mrs. Bedwin, Oliver looks just like her. The features are too similar. There was such a remarkable likeness that even Mr. Brownlow couldn't tear his eyes away from Oliver. One evening, he called the boy to his study. Oliver, my boy, I've grown quite fond of you. So has Mrs. Bedwin. I'm interested in your future. You won't send me away then, sir? Asked Oliver. Not at all. But I want to hear all about you. Where you were born. Where you've been living. How you got into thieving. Just then, Mr. Brownlow's old friend, Mr. Grimoire, came. He was a stout gentleman with a grouchy look on his face and a limp in his leg. Who is that boy? He demanded. I shall find out all tomorrow, promised Mr. Brownlow. Right now, I have an errand for him. Oliver, run to the bookstall and return some books for me. The owner sent too many and I'm paying for the ones I'm keeping. He handed Oliver a found pound note and asked him to bring back the change. After Oliver left, Mr. Grimwig warned Mr. Brownlow that the boy would run off with the money. Nonsense, snapped Mr. Brownlow. He is a good lad. When the Dodger and Charlie returned that fateful day from the robbery, Fajin saw that Oliver was not with them. Where is he? He roared. A very loud voice cut in before they could talk. It was one of Fajin's gang men, Bill Sykes. His face had beer stains and his clothes were dirty. There was a shaggy white dog at his feet. When he heard about Oliver and the robbery, he cursed Fajin for letting the boy go out before he was even ready. Oliver will blab to the police and get us all in trouble, Sykes complained. Find him and bring him back. No member of the gang was willing to go near the police station. They finally chose a young woman in their party, Nancy, who often did the gang's dirty work. They ordered her to dress well like a lady and go to the market. Once there, she cried. Oh, where's my brother? Will no one help me find him? I can't see any little boys, ma'am, said an officer at the police station. Nancy described Oliver. Oh, he said the gentleman. He was driven to the home of a gentleman in Pentoville. Fajin exploded when he heard the news. I don't care even if we have to kidnap him. He must be found and brought back here. Sykes and Nancy met Fajin at a tavern. They left immediately after receiving instructions from him. They located Oliver and followed him just as he was leaving Mr. Brownlow's house to run to the bookstore. They soon caught up with him. Oh, my dear brother, at last I found you, 
cried Nancy, throwing her arms around Oliver while a crowd gathered around them. Oliver was too surprised to even talk. He ran away from his parents who took such good care of him, explained Nancy. By joining a band of robbers, he almost broke his mother's heart. What a naughty boy, scolded an old woman. You go home and stay out of trouble, said another. But I have no parents, shouted Oliver. I'm an orphan. Suddenly, Sykes appeared with his dog. There you are, boy, he snarled. Go home this instant. Your mother is waiting for you. Help, cried Oliver as he was being dragged away. I don't know these people. Please don't let them take me away. Sykes took the books from Oliver and shouted, I bet you stole these too. The boy, still weak from his illness, was dragged away. A while later, he stood before Fajan with tears falling down his cheeks while his pockets were being emptied. Would you look at Oliver's new clothes and new books and look at the five pound note? That's my money, Sykes growled. No, it's mine, said Fajan. You can sell the books if you like. If Nancy and I won't get the money, we will take the boy back again. With a scold, Fajin handed over the money to Sykes. Don't take the books. They belong to the kind gentleman who took care of me when I was ill. Keep me if you want, but please return the money and the books or you will think I stole them, cried Oliver. Shut up! I will set the dog on you otherwise, threatened Sykes. Don't do it, cried Nancy. Leave the boy alone. Fajin advanced towards Oliver and began to hit him on his shoulders with a club when Nancy came between them. Stop! He's just a boy. You've got him back. What more do you want? Isn't it enough that you made him a thief? I stole things for you when I was younger than him. Leave me alone, Fajin. That's enough, Nancy, shouted Fajin. Charlie! Take Oliver to bed and make sure he doesn't wear fancy clothes again. Meanwhile, Mrs. Bedwin lit the oil lamps and sent the servants up and down the streets many times to find Oliver, but in vain. In the sitting room, Mr. Brownlow and Mr. Grimwick sat with grim expressions on their faces. Mr. Bumble had taken some time off from the workhouse to go to London to take care of some formal duties. At a local tavern, he read a notice which said, Five guineas reward to anyone who can give information about a young boy, Oliver Twist, who either ran away or was kidnapped last week from his home. The money goes to whoever finds Oliver or sheds light on his past. Mr. Brownlow's address with Oliver's description was printed at the bottom of the notice. Mr. Bumble quickly went to Mr. Brownlow's and found him sitting with Mr. Grimwick in the study. He told them all he knew about Oliver. The boy being born to a low parentage, attacking another boy and running away in the middle of the night. Mr. Bumble even presented legal papers claiming that he knew Oliver personally. Thank you for coming, said Mr. Brownlow sadly. Here's your money. I only wish your report about Oliver had been more favorable. He was such a dear sweet boy, said Mrs. Bedwin. I'm also disappointed with that boy. I don't want to ever hear his name mentioned in this house again. Is that clear? said Mr. Brownlow. Mr. Grimwick thought his friend looked upset, so he decided not to say, I told you so. One night, soon after Oliver was found, Fajin went to visit Sykes and Nancy. When are we doing the robbery at Chelsea? It doesn't look possible. None of the maids will go along with us, said Sykes. If you can't do it from the inside, what about from the outside? I'll give you something extra. Sykes nodded. But I've looked at the house. I will need someone small enough to climb through the little window. Oliver is perfect, said Fajin. He will be well trained this time. He won't cause trouble. We will do it two nights from today. There won't be any moonlight then. Nancy, you bring Oliver to me. Oliver was reading when Nancy sat on a chair and began moaning loudly, her head in her hands. God forgive me, but this wasn't my idea. Bill Sykes wants you. Do whatever he tells you and keep your mouth shut. 
He is mean and will kill you to save himself. What does he want me for? asked Oliver. For no good. She led Oliver out into the street. He thought of screaming for help and she read his mind. It wouldn't work. I tried helping you and it didn't work. I promised Fajin and Sykes that you would be quiet and obey them. If you do as they say quietly, nothing will happen to you or me. I don't want to die. Don't make me suffer more than I already am. When they met Sykes, he was loading a pistol. He warned Oliver that if he made a sound or gave them away, he'd be shot. At 5 a.m., Sykes and Oliver left the house. Oliver covered himself in a large cape and tied a handkerchief around his neck. He turned round to look at Nancy, but she was looking elsewhere. Sykes and Oliver walked for the whole day until they met another gang member, Toby Crackett. Hello, Bill, he said. Who is your dear friend? Oliver Twist, one of Fajin's boys. Toby looked at Oliver and grinned. The man was chubby, bald and dressed shabbily. He was smoking a long pipe and his rain-covered hands were filthy. After tucking pistols in their belt, they led Oliver into the foggy night. On reaching the house, Toby climbed the wall. Sykes handed Oliver to him, then jumped over himself. Please, let me go. I promise not to tell you so. Have mercy on me. Don't make me do this. Take this, said Sykes, handing a lantern to Oliver. Once you are in, unlock the door for us. My gun's pointed at you, so don't try and act smart. Oliver sneaked into the house and made his way into the front door to let the two men in. When all three of them were walking down the hall, Oliver decided to run up and warn the sleeping family even if it meant his death. Suddenly, Sykes was shouting from behind, Come back! Back! Frightened by Sykes' voice and by a loud cry from upstairs, Oliver dropped the lantern. A light appeared on top of the stairs and two frightened, half-dressed men appeared. There was a loud bang and Oliver staggered back. Oliver felt himself being dragged along while Sykes fired at the two men. Oliver had been shot and was bleeding badly. A cold deadly feeling crept over the boy. After a while, he saw and heard nothing. Mrs. Mann, the woman working at the workhouse where Oliver was born was having a tea with Mr. Bumble before a cherry fire. She enjoyed Mr. Bumble's visits for she had been a widow for 25 years and he was a single man. After he finished his tea, Mr. Bumble wiped his hands and suddenly leaned over and kissed Mrs. Mann on her lips. Mr. Bumble, stop or I shall scream. The next instant, the door was open and an ugly old woman poked her head inside. Mrs. Mann, old Sally is going fast. She won't last for long. She says she has something important to tell you. Annoyed at being disturbed, she excused herself and rushed to an attic room where old Sally lay. She was twisted with age and trembling with pain. Mrs. Mann snapped at the two ladies attending her. Listen, you old hacks. I don't have time to watch all the sick people in this place die. She was about to leave the room when old Sally rose up and stretched out her arms. Don't go, she whispered. Come here. I have something to tell you. In a half, Mrs. Mann walked to the bedside. Listen, rasped the old woman. In this very room, I once nursed a pretty young thing who was brought in with her feet cut and bleeding and her clothing covered in dirt. She gave birth to a baby boy. What about her? asked Mrs. Mann. The old woman's eyes popped out and she moaned. I robbed her. Before her body was cold, I robbed her of one item she had. She could have sold it for food or shelter but she kept it safe until I took it when she died. It was pure gold. Gold? This excited Mrs. Mann. Well, tell me, who was this woman? The poor thing trusted me to keep it safe, but she is gone and the child might be dead too. If so, it's my fault. Had they known, he'd have been treated better. 
This puzzled Mrs. Mann. What are you talking about, woman? The boy looked so much like her. Poor child. She was so young. The dying woman was out of breath and she fell back on her pillow. Tell me before it's too late, shouted Mrs. Mann. The mother whispered that if the baby lived, he shouldn't feel ashamed to mention his mother's name. Old Sally murmured. What was the boy's name? asked the frustrated Mrs. Mann. Oliver, the gold I stole, I sold it at a pawn shop. Before she could utter another word, her head fell to the side, her body lifeless. Disgusted Mrs. Mann took a piece of paper from old Sally's hands and called the attendants to take care of the body. Sergeant Charlie and the Dodger waited eagerly for news of the robbery. Toby Crackett dragged himself into the room and fell on a chair, silent for several moments. How is Bill Sykes? he asked finally. What? screamed Fajan. Do you mean... asked Toby. Where are Sykes and Oliver, Toby? asked Fajan. Why haven't they returned with you? The robbery failed, said Toby quietly. They fired and shot the boy. We ran away with him, but the noise had everyone chasing us in the countryside. What happened to the boy? Bill carried him on his back until the boy started becoming too heavy. The mob almost reached us, so it was every man for himself. We left the boy in a ditch. Fajin let out a cry of frustration and walked to the three cripples inn where Sykes usually visited. Have you seen Sykes? He asked the owner, who shook his head. It's monks here. If you see him, tell him I have something to tell him. He should be here in 10 minutes, said the owner. I can't wait here. Tell him to see me tomorrow. Fajin then went and told Nancy everything. She shook her head sadly and said it was probably better that the boy was dead than being with them. Fajin raged about Sykes for a while, then left. When he got home, a dark shadowy figure stood at his doorway. I've been waiting two hours for you, said the man. Where were you? Out on your business all night, monks, said Fajin nervously. We will talk inside. Fajin then told monks of the unsuccessful robbery. It wasn't planned well. Why didn't you keep Oliver here and make a pickpocket of him? Or set him up to be arrested for life? That didn't interest me. But it wasn't easy training him in the business. He wasn't like the other boys. I had nothing to hold against him. What could I do? When I sent him with the Dodger and Charlie to pickpocket at the bookstore, he failed and got caught. Then he was taken in by the very man the boys were trying to rob. Not my fault, grumbled Monks. I know, said Fajin. In fact, since you had never seen him before, you couldn't have recognized him as the boy you were looking for when you knocked him down for the police to nap. I got Nancy to get him back for you, but now she's begun to like him. Spank Nancy then, said Monks, biting his wooden purple lips angrily. Can't, but I can turn Oliver into a thief, if he's still alive. If he's dead, I had nothing to do with it. I told you from the start, no murders. I'd always feel guilty and... Suddenly, Monk stopped and noticed the shadow of a woman outside the window. Had someone overheard them? They went out to check but there was no one around. Oliver, thrown in a ditch, woke up hours later. His little body wrapped with pain from the gunshot. A bloodied bandage was wrapped around his left arm. He shriveled to his feet and walked to the nearest house which happened to be the house he had been told to rob. He staggered across the lawn, breathing heavily, and knocked on the door faintly. The servants, girls and brittles, ran to the window. Why, it's a boy, and his head badly. They recognize him as one of the robbers, and the one girl shot. Let's see that he lives. I want to see him hung for his crime. Enough, girls, said the mistress of the house. Run to town and fetch the doctor. There were two ladies in the house. One was a stately older woman, Mrs. Maylie. The other was her niece, a beautiful 17-year-old called Rose. 
They followed Dr. Losborn into a room where Oliver lay and were shocked to see how young Oliver was. Rosemary bent over him and gently brushed the hair from his face. Poor thing, she could. To think that this poor boy was turned into a robber. Maybe he never knew a mother's love or the love of a family. Maybe he was forced into a life of crime because he was starving. We must think this over before we have him arrested. Oliver was very ill and weak from loss of blood. But he gradually improved after several days of care by Mrs. Maley, Rose and the doctor. When he had gained a little strength, he told the Maleys about his past, making Rose weep bitterly. She had come to care a lot for the boy. We must help the boy, she begged her aunt. Yes, she agreed. Can you do something? She asked Dr. Losborn. Maybe we can convince the servants that they were mistaken about the boy's identity. Then we can save him from the police. The kind doctor called girls and brittles and asked them if they could do what was asked. When the policeman arrived, they didn't identify the boy, so Oliver was free of charges. It wasn't difficult to do since Oliver looked helpless. How could this little boy rob a house? Oliver recovered quickly from his wounds and spent happy days with the Maleys. One day, Dr. Losborn decided to take Oliver to Mr. Brownlow. Oliver agreed, for he wanted to clear any misunderstanding between him and Mr. Brownlow. But alas, when they got there, they saw that the house was empty and that a for rent sign was put up before it. Where has Mr. Brownlow gone? The doctor asked a neighbor. He packed his things and left for the West Indies six weeks ago. His housekeeper and his friend, Mr. Grimwick, went with him. Oliver was disappointed, but he kept helping Rose and Mrs. Maley do chores. He also learned how to read and write well. He spent many happy hours running about the country picking flowers and would listen to Rose play the piano in the evenings. The happy days ended suddenly when Rose fell terribly ill. She got weaker by the day. Mrs. Maley sent Oliver running four miles to leave a message for Dr. Losborn at the post office. When Oliver was watching the postman saddle his horse, a horrible looking man with purple lips and red sores on his hands came running towards him from the inn. Curse you, the man yelled. Why can't I ever be free of you? The man came rushing at Oliver with his fist raised. The boy turned and ran away at full speed. He turned again to watch the man fall to the ground, writhing and foaming in a fit. When Dr. Losborn arrived, he saw that there was hardly any chance of Rose's recovery. There is nothing to do but pray. He stayed by his side for three days and three nights. On the fourth day, he went out with relief on his face. Rose would live. Her fever had gone. Oliver was overjoyed and rushed to the garden to pick up the most beautiful flowers for Rose. While he was doing that, he saw a carriage pull up at the front of the house and a handsome man got off. It was Mrs. Maley's son, Harry. He rushed to his mother. Mother, why didn't you tell me about Rose? What if she had died? He cried. You know why, son? If a rich and successful man marries a woman whose name is stained because of her birth, it will be quite sad indeed. I love both you and Rose dearly, but the wicked people will not let her forget her past, even though it was not her fault. She will suffer if you turn against her. I would never do that, shouted Harry. She is my life, my love. Let her decide if she wants me. The following evening, Oliver was sitting on the porch when suddenly he saw Fajin's face before him. Come away with me, my boy, Fajin pleaded. Then, another man appeared next to Fajin. It was the same horrible man who tried to attack Oliver outside the inn. The next instant, they were all gone and Oliver ran screaming for help. Harry knew about Oliver and understood his fears. He and Gil searched the grounds but no one was found. You must have imagined them, Oliver, said Harry when they returned. I really saw them, he insisted. When Rose recovered from a fever, Harry had a long talk with her. 
I wish you hadn't come, she said with tenderness in her eyes. I know, my dear, but I was so worried about you. I wouldn't bear to leave your side when I love you so much, said Harry. Your future is so bright, Harry. I want you to devote your time more to noble things. The one I crave for most is you, darling Rose. My future is with you. I have loved you since the first time I saw you when we were children. Please remember me as your childhood friend and forget that you loved me, Rose begged. Why are you telling me this? I must protect you from what people will say. They should learn the circumstances of my birth. Rose, do you love me? With all my heart, but we shouldn't meet again. You are destined for greatness. I can't mix with those who would scorn me because of my background. Please go. All right, agreed Harry, but only if you let me ask you again a year from now. Fine, but you won't change my mind. Harry guarded Rose in his arms and kissed her tenderly on her lips. He then walked out of the room. Mr. Bumble and Mrs. Mann were now married. He became master of the workhouse and was tenor than ever. One day after a violent argument with his wife, he went to a tavern for a drink. The only person around was a tall man with an ugly face and sharp eyes. His hands were covered with red sores. Were you looking for me when you peered through the window? The stranger asked. Mr. Bumble shook his head. I thought so. If you were, you'd have known my name. Well, don't ask for it. I know you. Are you the parish official? Yes. I'm master of the workhouse, said Mr. Bumble proudly. Good. I was looking for you. I need some information. I will pay you for it, said the man. The stranger pushed a handful of coins across the table and Mr. Bumble pocketed them. Now, said the stranger, think back 12 years ago, a scene at the workhouse. A woman gave birth to a boy who was left to the parish to take care of. There are many such cases, said Mr. Bumble. This one grew into a pale-faced weak boy who was sent to work with an undertaker and then ran away to London. Oliver Twist! Right. Now where is the hag who looked after his mother? Asked the stranger. She died last winter. Suddenly the stranger rose to leave. Wait, said Mr. Bumble. The night old Sally died. She confessed something to my wife, but not entirely, for she died before she could finish. I don't know what she told my wife exactly. She can tell you more. Where can I find her? Asked the stranger. I will bring her to you. The man gave Mr. Bumble an address with no name and told him to be there by 9 o'clock p.m. the following evening. What's your name, sir? Monks, replied the stranger and walked out. It was humid and cloudy when Mr. and Mrs. Bumble arrived at the location. Thunder and lightning flashed across the sky. Hello, shouted Monks. He led them to a small room with shattered windows. Let's get to the point, he said. Why did the hag tell you the night she died? What is the information worth to you? Asked Mrs. Bumble calmly while her husband thought she'd gone mad. Depends on what you tell me, said Monks. I will take 25 pounds in gold. Monks hesitated for a minute before handing over the money. Mrs. Bumble told him that old Sally spoke of a young mother who gave birth to a boy in the very bed she died. The child was called Oliver. Go on pleaded monks. Old Sally robbed the mother when she died. She took a piece of gold jewelry. What did she do with it? She was about to tell me when she fell back on the bed. Dead. That's all she said, cried monks. You lie. Undisturbed, Mrs. Bumble continued. She didn't say another word. That's the honest truth. But when she grabbed my hand, she was clutching a piece of paper. What was it? A pawnbroker's ticket. She must have sold the object for money. What did you do? I went to the pawnbroker and paid off the loan plus interest to get the jewelry back. Do you have it? Asked Monks. Right here. Mrs. Bumble took out a small box containing a plain gold wedding ring and a little gold locket with two locks of hair. 
The locket had the name Agnes written on it. There was a space left for the last name. Then there was the date, which was within the year Oliver was born. Manx was happy. Suddenly, Manx opened a trap door, exposing the raging river below. He covered the box in a handkerchief tied to a rock and threw it into the moving waters. He watched the rock drag the box to the bottom of the river. He turned to Mr. and Mrs. Bumble. This is just between us. Understood? They nodded and left quickly, happy to get out unharmed. The night after Monks met the Bumbles, Fajin went to see Sykes and Nancy. Where have you been, Fajin? demanded Sykes impatiently. I was away on business, he replied. Well, I need money. If it hadn't been for Nancy, I'd have died. I will send some money over with the Dodger, said Fajin. I don't trust that boy. I will send Nancy to pick it up. While at Fajin's, Nancy saw Monks arriving. He and Fajin walked upstairs to another room to talk. Nancy followed and stood quietly outside the door. When they came down, she was down putting her shawl and bonnet on. She didn't look at Fajin when he dropped the coins in her hand. She was too frightened at what she heard upstairs. She was weak and pale by the time she reached Sykes with the money. What's wrong? asked Sykes. Nothing, she replied with false gaiety. Later that night, she slipped some sleeping powder into Sykes' drink. After he dozed off, she slipped out of the house. I hope I'm not too late. She prayed as she walked into a fancy hotel in the west end of London. She told the doorman breathlessly that she wanted to see Miss Mayley. The doorman looked at her outfit and tried to shoo her away. Please, I must see her, she cried. Whom shall I say is calling? asked the doorman. I can't give a name, she replied. What's your business? Can't say that either. I really need to talk to her. She looked around for help, pleading. Will no one carry a message for me to Miss Maylie? One of the kind servants came to her. What's your message, love? She asked. Tell Miss Maylie I'd like to speak to her alone. Tell her it's very important. Nancy thought that a great gulf separated her from the elegant Rose Maylie. Nancy spent her whole life on the meanest streets in town, but she still had some pride. It's not easy to see you, she said when Rose arrived. I'm sorry if you were treated harshly, Rose told her. Now, why do you wish to see me? Hearing the girl's gentle voice, Nancy burst into tears, surprising Rose. I'm risking my life by coming here. I was the one who dragged Oliver back to Fajin's house from Mr. Brownlow's. What? Rose exclaimed. There's more. If those people knew I was here talking to you, they'd murder me. Do you know the man called Monks? Rose shook her head. Well, he knows you and that you live here. I found you because I overheard him talking about you. I understand. Go on, urged Rose. Soon after Oliver came to your house, I began suspecting Monks. I learned that Monks had coincidentally seen Oliver the day he was sent to rob Mr. Brownlow. Monks recognized him as the child he was looking for. I don't know the reason. He made a deal with Fajan that if Oliver was returned, he'd get an even larger sum than if he made Oliver into a thief. A thief? Why? asked Rose. Monks saw my shadow on the wall as I tried to eavesdrop, so I had to run away. I didn't see him again until last night. He came to see Fajin and I listened to their conversation. Monk said that the only proof of Oliver's true identity lay at the bottom of the river and that the old hag who received the proof was dead. Then Monks laughed and said that he now had all of Oliver's money for himself, but that it would be fun to see the boy thieving and going to jail. Monks wanted to get everything from his father's will and wanted Oliver out of the way. He said Fajin could arrange for the boy to get caught and hang for his crime. Rose listened, dumbfounded. Nancy spoke faster, for she had to leave. She told Rose that Monks could kill Oliver to get what he wanted. He told Fajin, I may harm him yet. You can't imagine the traps I've set for my little brother, Oliver. Oliver is his brother? asked Rose. Yes, now I must leave. 
Wait, why do you want to return to these horrible people if they will harm you? I can help you get a safe place, offered Rose. I thank you, dear lady, but I must go, said Nancy. But how can I help Oliver? You must know someone who will keep your secret and advise you what to do. Well, if I need to see you, where can I find you? You promise to come alone if I tell you? I promise, said Rose. Every Sunday night, every Sunday night, from 11 o'clock till midnight, I will walk on London Bridge if I'm still alive. At least, take this money so that you can leave an honest woman, begged Rose. Nancy thanked her but declined and hurried off into the night, leaving Rose to collect her thoughts. Rose loved Oliver and wanted to help him regain his good name, but she did not want to be the cause of Nancy's death at the same time. I found Mr. Brownlow, cried Oliver, bursting into the room. I was walking with girls and saw Mr. Brownlow get off his carriage and go into a house. I couldn't go to him because I was scared, but I wrote down the address. I must see him. Let's go then, said Rose, thinking the gentleman would be very good in helping Oliver. They arrived at the Craven Street and she told Oliver to wait in the coach while she spoke to Mr. Brownlow. She was taken to the study where Mr. Brownlow sat with Mr. Grimwick. I'm Rose Maley, she said. You once showed great kindness to a young friend of mine and I thought you'd be interested in knowing how he is. His name is Oliver Twist. Mr. Brownlow was too surprised to speak for several moments. He finally drew his chair closer to Rose. My dear lady, I'd be happy if you can change the bad impression I have of the boy. I've tried so hard to find him. She told him all that happened to Oliver and the news brought Mr. Brownlow relief. You bring good news. Where is he? He asked. He's waiting in the coach just outside, she replied. Mr. Brownlow rushed out and brought Oliver inside. He then summoned Mrs. Bedwin. It was a happy reunion indeed. While Oliver was busy chatting with Mrs. Bedwin, Rose told the men what Nancy told her. Mr. Grimwick bristled in anger. Calm down, said Mr. Brownlow. We can't arrest them all. You must act carefully. You must find Oliver's parents and return his inheritance to him. We have to get Monks alone and make sure he confesses. After all, he isn't a gang member. We have to ask Nancy to show us who Monks is, or at least tell us about his locations, so that we can nab him in such a way that she won't be in trouble. They decided to keep Oliver in the dark but tell Mrs. Maley, Harry and Dr. Losborn about their plan, who agreed immediately. Good. Then Sunday night, I'll go with Rose to meet Nancy on London Bridge, said Mr. Brownlow. That very night, Noah Claypool and Charlotte were on their way to London. They carried with them all their belongings. After traveling on the main road for a while, Charlotte began to complain. I'm tired. When do we get there? She asked. Stop whining. If it wasn't for me, you would have never gotten out of that place, said Noah. You took the sour berries money, didn't you? Only for you, dearest. Noah let her hold it so that if they were caught, he would be free and she would go to jail. They decided to rest at the Three Cripples Inn. He took the heavy bundle off Charlotte's back before they walked in just to make a good impression. At the bar was an old man whom the bartender called Fajin. The couple sat down and ordered beer and meat. Fajin observed the newcomers. Look at how the girl obeys the man. He knows how to train them. Be quiet now. I want to hear what they are saying, he told the bartender. I don't want to empty tills anymore. Noah, I want us to live a luxurious life, said Charlotte. There are other things to empty besides tills. Pockets, houses, mail coaches, banks. You can't do it by yourself. I will have to join a gang. You would be helpful too, Charlotte. You are a clever woman. That was all the information Fajin needed. He went and seated himself at their table. They looked at him in fear. Don't worry, I can help you. All the people in this inner in the field you are just talking about, myself included. If you want to join us, I can recommend you. 
Would we have to hand over our money to join you? Asked Noah quietly. No other way. You can't spend it anyway. Their bills will have numbers from the bank. We would have to send them out of the country. So, what are your wages? Asked Noah. Board, lodging, pipes, spirits for free. Half of what you both earn. I'd like to start with something easy. Not too dangerous. How about spying on someone? Asked Fajan. When Noah agreed, he said, Perfect. I will see you by 10 tomorrow. All Sunday evening, Nancy sat listening to Sykes and Fajan's plan. At 11 o'clock, she put on her bonnet and prepared herself to meet Rosemary. Where do you think you are going? Fajan demanded. Just getting some fresh air, Fajan, she replied. You are going nowhere. Sit down, growled Sykes. I want to go out for a bit. Let me go, she screamed. There's more than enough air here. He held her arms and dragged her to the chair and made her sit down forcefully. They watched her till midnight and Nancy thought there was no way she could meet Rose now. Girl's gone mad, said Sykes. Why do you think she was so eager to go out? Women are stubborn. They are harder to train than the rest, said Fajan. But Fajan thought about Nancy's behavior all the way home. It almost seemed as if she was tired of living with Sykes. The girl might have a new lover, even though Sykes saved her from the workhouse when she was a child. If that were so, she would have to find out who the man was. He also thought that no one was the perfect person to spy on her. The following morning, Fajin met Noah. I have an important job for you. I hope it's not too dangerous. Not at all, Fajin reassured. All you have to do is to follow a young woman. I want you to see where she's going whom she's meeting, everything. How much is it worth for you? asked Noah. If you are good, then you get a pound. That's a lot for following a woman. Then, so who is she? asked Noah. One of us. You don't trust her anymore? She's found some new friends. I want to know who they are, said Fajan. She's at the three cripples now. I will point her out to you. Once done, Noah followed Nancy all week. She met no one. Finally on Sunday night, she left the inn and walked swiftly towards London Bridge before midnight. Noah followed her at a safe distance. When the clock struck midnight, a young woman and a grey-haired gentleman stepped off a coach. Nancy mentioned for them to follow her towards the steps leading down the bridge. Why weren't you here last Sunday? asked Mr. Brownlow. I couldn't come. Bill Sykes forced me to stay at home. The only way I could see Miss Maylie at the hotel was by putting sleeping powder in his drink. Did he wake up while you were gone? No, thank God. Good. Now listen to me. Miss Maylie told me all that you've told her. I want you to trust me, for I believe you. Don't fear. Our plan is to make this monk's fellow tell us what he knows. But if he cannot be found or won't talk, then you must deliver Fajin in our hands, said Mr. Brownlow. Fajin? I can't do that. I will never do that. Why? He has never turned against me, so I have no reason to turn against him, Nancy replied. In that case, give me monks and I will deal with him. We only want to help Oliver. Will you help us find the man? Yes, said Nancy with a sigh. Monks is tall and strong. He is 26 with dark hair and eyes. His face is old and sunken. He has terrible fits, so his lips are purple and covered with teeth marks. Sometimes, he bites his own hand when he has a fit. He has a large cloak, but if you watch carefully, he's got a broad red mark on his throat, like a burn. Both Mr. Brownlow and Rose gasped. Do you know him? asked Nancy. I think so. Please continue. He spends a lot of time at the tavern called the Three Cripples. You will find him there. You've given us good information, said Mr. Brownlow. How can we be of service to you? He asked. There is nothing you can do for me, said Nancy. 
smiling sadly. We can help you get away from Fajin and the others. We can give you a place in England or abroad. Live with us while there is still time. Thank you for your kindness, sir. I am chained to my life, even if I hate it. Now I must leave before anyone misses me. Good night. His head bursting with information, Noah ran to Fajin's house as fast as he could. Once Noah told him about the meeting, Fajin sent for Sykes to tell him about what Nancy did. An enraged Sykes rushed home and got into the room where Nancy slept. He grabbed her by the throat and dragged her to the floor. Bill, what's wrong? What are you doing? She gasped. You have followed tonight, you traitor. Every word was overheard, he screamed. Then spare my life as I spared yours and Fajin's, cried the girl. Listen, the gentleman and the lady offered to send me a good home abroad. Let me ask them to do same for you. We can leave all this and start a new life together. She held on to his feet so tightly it was difficult to pry her off. With effort, he grabbed his pistol and pointed it at Nancy, only to realize that a shot would attract attention to him. He then brought the gun down with all his might upon her head. She staggered and fell, blinded momentarily as blood gushed out from the wound. With her final breath, she begged for mercy, tears streaming down her face. Sykes reached for his club, closed his eyes and struck her repeatedly until she was dead. Sykes sat by the body for hours till sunrise, rocking back and forth. He finally got up and walked to the fire where he threw the club. He then washed the blood off him and changed his clothes. He decided not to stay there any longer. He took his dog, locked the house and went away. This place wasn't safe for a murderer. He considered taking money from Fajin and escaping to France. First, however, he had to get rid of the dog in case there were descriptions of a man with a dog. He tied a rope around the dog and drowned it, but the animal sensed his plan and ran away. Sykes then continued his journey alone. A coach pulled up in front of Mr. Brownlow's house. He got out and waited, while two strong men dragged monks out. How dare you kidnap me on the street, he shouted. I have my reasons, said Mr. Brownlow calmly. I gave you a choice to come here or surrender yourself to the police. You agreed to come with us quietly. If you try and leave now, I will have you arrested. Is this the treatment I should get from my father's oldest friend? Asked monks. It's because I'm your father's friend. That's why I'm treating you rather gently. Edward Leeford, although you should be ashamed to bear that name. Your father's sister would have been my wife had she lived. I've never forgotten him or her. But what do you want with me? This is about your brother, replied Mr. Brownlow. I have no brother. Didn't you know I was the only child? What I do know is that your father, when he was young, was forced into a wretched and unhappy marriage to a woman much older than him. You were born out of that miserable marriage. Your parents separated later. About 15 years ago when you were 11, your father made a new friend, a man whose wife had recently died, leaving him with two daughters. One was a beautiful girl of 19 and the other was hardly three or four. Your father fell in love with the elder daughter and she with him. Then one of your rich relatives died, leaving your father a large sum of money. Your mother was living a frivolous life in Paris and when she heard about the money, she followed your father to Rome, bringing you along. Your father died suddenly the day after she arrived, leaving no will, so all his money automatically went to you and your mother. Monks leaned forward in his chair and held his breath. But your father came to see me before he left for Rome, said Mr. Brownlow. I never knew that, shouted Monks. He left me with some possessions that he couldn't take along to Rome. Among them was a portrait of a beautiful young woman that he truly loved, one that himself painted years ago. He was willing to sell off everything and give the money to you and your mother so that he could start a new life with the one he loved. But sadly, that didn't happen. Soon after he died, I tried to find the woman, for she was carrying his child. I wanted to give them both a home with me, but when I got to the father's home, I learned that the father had left for London a week before. When that child, a boy, was born, 
His mother died alone and friendless. He was a sickly child as he grew, but fate made me find him, so that I could save him from a life of evil. What? exclaimed monks. I was shocked to see the resemblance between him and the woman in the portrait I just told you about. You have no proof that the boy was my father's. But I do, said Mr. Brownlow. You see, there was a will, one that your mother burnt, but not before telling you what it said. The will spoke of a child to be born. When you saw Oliver and recognized him, you threw the only proof of identity he had into the river. You are unworthy and a coward, one who mixes with thieves and murderers. A girl was killed because she told your secrets. Are you going to tell me the rest now? Yes, said Monks, as he sagged in his chair. You will also give your poor brother all that is rightfully his. Then I hope never to see you again. Suddenly, Dr. Losborn rushed in. The murderer will be caught tonight, he announced. Harry Mele is helping the police nab Fajan. With these words, the two men walked out, locking monks in the room. In a place called Jacob's Island, a rugged place near Thames River, Toby Crockett and Charlie Bates waited in a decaying house. When did they get Fajan? asked Toby. This afternoon, I escaped up the chimney, replied Charlie. Noah was caught as well, but Fajin went down fighting, muddy and bleeding. Just then, Sai's dog ran into the room. He was limping and almost dead from hunger and thirst. Oh dear, I hope Sai doesn't show up. He's probably out of the country by now. They gave the dog water and some food and waited for a couple of hours. Much later, the dog opened and Sykes walked in, his face looking dark. Monster! Murderer! cried his one-time friends. Their shouts were drowned by the noise of the mob outside. The tide was in when I came, said Sykes. Get me a long rope. I will climb to the roof and lower myself into the ditch. Hurry or I will kill you. Sykes fastened the rope to the chimney and made the other end into a loop. He would lower himself and cut the rope when he was nearly touching the ground. As he slipped the loop over his head, he lost his balance and fell off the roof. The noose tightened around his neck as he fell, and with a sudden jerk, his lifeless body swung outside the house. The knife was still clenched in his stiffening hand. Oliver was back in his birthplace. He came with the Maylis, Dr. Losborn, Mr. Brownlow. Mrs. Bedwin and a man he didn't know. This man had cursed him when he was sending a letter to Dr. Losborn, and it was the same man who saw him sitting on the porch at the Maley house. When they were all seated in the big hotel room, Mr. Brownlow turned to Monks. This child is your half-brother, the son of your father and Agnes Fleming, the young woman he wanted to marry before his death. She died giving birth to Oliver. We must now hear the rest from you, monks. Monks looked angrily at Oliver and began. Listen well, my father, also Oliver's father, became ill in Rome. My mother and I joined him there. After he died, I found two papers in his desk. One was a letter written to you, Mr. Brownlow, the other to Agnes. She was pregnant with his unborn child. He told her he wanted to marry her to hide her shame. He reminded her of his love and of the gifts he gave her, a gold ring and a locket with her name on it. There was space after her name for his name, which he hoped would be added someday. He begged for her to wear the locket next to her heart. Oliver listened, tears falling down his face. Tell us about the will, monks, demanded Mr. Brownlow. Monks was silent. Very well, I will tell it said Mr. Brownlow. It spoke of your father's unhappy marriage to your mother, whose wicked nature thought you his only son to hate him. Yet in spite of that, your father left you both a sum of £800 a year in his will. Most of the property, he left for Agnes and their unborn child. If that child was a boy, he would get his inheritance, but only if he didn't dishonor the family name. That's why monks wanted Oliver to get arrested, so that his name would get spoiled. My mother burned the will, 
said Monks. Agnes never got that letter. But when she told father about the child, Mr. Fleming took his two daughters to Wales. Because of the shame, he changed his name. Agnes too, ashamed to stay, ran away to the workhouse in this town where she gave birth to Oliver. Her father searched for her in vain. He was so sure that she'd kill herself that he died of broken hearts. Mr. Brownlow continued. Years later when Monk's mother was dying, she told him these secrets. She believed that a baby boy was born to Agnes. You swore to her that you'd hunt the boy down and never let him rest in peace. Yes, I wanted to drag him to the gallows, said Monks, making everyone gasp at his cruel words. Mr. Brownlow then told them that Fajon was given a big reward to keep the boy, but would have to give a bit away should the boy get rescued. He asked Monks about the locket and the ring, to which Monks replied that he'd thrown them into a river. Mr. Grimwick then brought in Mr. and Mrs. Bumble. At first, they denied everything. Then, the two hags who attended to Old Sally were brought in. We had everything Old Sally told you, one of them told Mrs. Bumble. We peeked in and saw you take the paper from her hands. We followed you to the pawn shop and saw you get the locket and ring. Yes, I sold the items to that man, Mrs. Bumble mumbled, pointing to Monks. I shall see that you and your husband are never in trustworthy positions again, said Mr. Brownlow. You may go. He then turned to Rose. Do you know this young lady? He asked Monks. Yes, he replied. But I've never seen you before, Rose said. Agnes had a sister. What happened to the other child, Monks? When her father died, no one could trace any of her relatives. She was taken in and raised by some poor cottage people. My mother found her and tormented her, making her life miserable. One day, a widowed lady saw her and had pity on her. She took the girl in and gave her a happy life. I never saw her again until a few months ago. Where is she now? Right there, he said, pointing at Rose. Oliver rushed to embrace his long last aunt, Rose, who embraced both him and Mrs. Maylie. Harry turned to Rose. My dear Rose, I know everything. I'd like to remind you of a promise you made to me. Now that you know of my past, I'm even more unworthy to you, cried Rose. No, said the handsome young man. I decided that if I could not make my world yours, I'd make yours mine. I want only to marry you, my darling. Fajin was pronounced guilty of all the crimes he committed. Loud shouts of joy were heard after the hearing. Rose Fleming and Harry Maley were married in a little country church and with Mrs. Maley's blessings enjoyed many years of happiness together. Mr. Brownlow arranged for the property to be divided between Oliver and Monks. However, Monks squandered his share and soon returned to his criminal life. He died in a faraway jail. Charlie Bates became a respectable citizen. Noah received pardon from the police for helping them nab Fajin. Mr. and Mrs. Bumble lost their positions as head of the workhouse. They became so poor that they had to live as paupers in the same workhouse where they once treated orphans so badly. As for Oliver, Mr. Brownlow adopted him and he put his old life behind him forever.